Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon in Italy. This is Monica Larner, and it's Thursday, so it's time for another um, ser another appointment in our series on Italian wine, the Italian wine series, another episode. Um, today, I will be speaking with Filippo Chia of Castello Romitorio. In fact, I see he is requesting right now, go live with Filippo excited because speaking with Filippo gives us the opportunity to speak about Brunello di Montalcino, of course, uh, a wine that we love very much, um, and other things. Hi, Filippo. Ciao, Monica. Hi, how Come are style. you? I'm good. Well, thank I'm you. good. I'm good. You look good. Are you in Rome? Uh, no, I'm in Scansano at the moment. Oh, you're in Scansano. I'm sorry. We have... Yes. <laughs> we just spoke. Sorry. In fact, you had said I that. Know, but but I... <laughs> I don't, I don't think I mentioned it, or maybe I did. But. Oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Filippo, so the last time I actually saw you was here in California. Um, in fact, when things than... were all about 16 months ago, when things exactly. were still kind of seeming normal. <laughs> yeah. we it were, was one it of was the, the last day of... meals. Right. It was the Super Bowl. In fact, I think it was like the last meal. It was. Because I... Never went out after that again. Yeah, me neither. I think that's one of the last meals I had in company. In <laughs> fact, oh, was it Super Bowl? I don't remember that. It's been. It a... was Super Bowl because remember there was the um, the big halftime show that we watched. We oh, did correct. like a little correct. tour of the vineyard. And we said, Let's it watch was... the halftime show. It was an and, epic um... day, <laughs> and I love to see the sand in your vineyards and to see where you were located in the big oak trees. It's just incredible. Oh, it was fantastic. So... But I mean, but we were already because already we're like, oh, this virus thing. This it seems virus thing like it's getting... around the corner. In fact, <laughs> in fact, and it, you know, it was much worse than anyone could have ever imagined. Really, but exactly. At the exactly. time, it seemed like uh, anyway, the calm before the storm. The calm before the storm. Yeah. So, um, so I am so happy to speak with you today. Um, it seems like perfect timing since a lot of people, obviously are talking about Brunello, uh, Brunello 16 from the 2016 in vintage fact. is on the market now with some beautiful Brunello di Montalcino Reservas from the 15 vintage 2015. Ciao Giuseppe, my favorite Giuseppe is here, my squiglia. Um, so we, <laughs> Ciao, there's a lot of, <laughs> there are a lot of great, uh, great wines to talk about. And, uh, but before we jump into Brunello, I wanted to ask you to give us a little bit of um background of your background and of Castello Rumitorio. Well, um, okay. My background, <laughs> my personal background is that I was born in the city of New York in 1983. Um, and my father is a painter and my mother's a poet. So I grew up, you know, kind of between the summers in Italy and the winters in New York. I actually had never seen a, uh, a New York summer until I was 19 years old. So as soon as school let out, we'd go to Italy. And it was kind of like going into time travel because I met people who saw their first car when they were 40 years old. You know, in Italy, we were like 30 years behind, let's say, America, or at least the Big Apple. Um, and what was very interesting, my parents were separated. They both had farms, my dad in Montalcino and my mother in Lazio a hazelnut farm, which strangely enough actually has something to do with wine, at least in Piedmont, um, in terms of uh, the way you prune. Anyway, so anyway, I just came from an agricultural background, but also with this city vibe. Um, and my summers were spent mostly by myself with my parents. So my way out of, or my way around to keep myself busy was to walk through the forest. My best friend was Orlando Sesti. So I always had my dirt bike and drove to uh, the Sestis um, or, or La Maja, Fabian. He was one of my great friends. So I'd always go dirt biking up that way. And we, we owned an estate in Poggio di So in Castanovo de la Bate, which is in the southeast of Montalcino. So let's say I was always on the dirt bike, always in the forest, always driving around. And that's kind of how I, I, I was able to zone and, and understand how Montalcino works and where, where the rivers are, where the hills are, what kind of forests are, what the smells are in the morning and at night. So that, let's say that was like how I really fell in love with, with Montalcino was on my dirt bike. <laughs> and, uh, and dad, you know, bought the castle in 1984. I was born in 83. So as long as I can remember, my first memories were 
sleeping in this cot in this abandoned castle. And at the time, it had no roof. It had just, you know, the roof had, was being redone. But at the time, I mean, it could rain and you wouldn't be rained on. But there was one room that was for us living. And the rest of the house was under reconstruction. And the, I remember the youngest guy on the team was like 75 years old, the youngest, you know, Mason. And that's where I learned the Motelchino dialect was from these guys with their lunch break. And I just saw this castle who once had sheep living in it um, turned into this kind of really well, well restored and very original because dad cared very much for choosing the right brick, the right copo. And, and just it was, it was kind of like it came to life. And then he moved on because as he's an artist, he's a painter. So, um, but he had been to California. And at the time they planted, even in the 80s, they were still planting basically with the plow. I mean, there was no big caterpillars breaking the earth, doing, you know, one and a half meter, you know, really preparing the deep vines rips. as yeah. deep rips as we were already seeing in the U.S. So dad was one of the first to do deep rips and one of the first to use wood because before it was mostly cement poles um, in, in Motelchino because there was some kind of similar, you know, it was assimilated to some kind of modernity or functionality. Um, and, and as a child, I just remember this, this process of regaining these. There were small, small openings in the forest, which I believe had been vineyards at the time because Romitorio means hermitage. So it was most probably a monastery, but possibly also a prison because we've, we've d doing some research. It may have been a Roman prison for, for Christians running away from Rome. And as you know, um, Motelchino's on the Cassia, which is probably the most important artery right. for moving Rome. from Florence to Motelchino. So if anyone had been going through that part of town or of Tuscany, they'd probably stop over to change their horse, to change their... And so um, in, in this kind of very particular location, and there's two navigable, navigable rivers, the Ombrona and the Orcha, which were navigable until um, basically, I think, the 17th or 18th century. So this, this kind of crossroads of, of things created in Motelchino, very interesting, you know, I think m merchantry of all sorts. There was sewing, there was winemaking, there was, uh, even though it, was, it fell into, when we were, I mean, in the 60s, it was the, one of the poorest communes in all of Tuscany, which preserved it really well. So there's no heavy industry. Right. There's no zona industriale, which would be like the warehouse district. Um, and in this whole very untouched, unspoiled area, my dad kind of, in a very soft way, just settled in and became the 42nd producer um, in Maltalcino. Uh Today, we have over 200 wineries. Um, some very big, also special interests and so forth. But that said, uh, the f original big special interest, it was Banfi, who taught everyone in the whole world about Brunello. So Motelcino is actually really fortunate to have this kind of industrial leader. Right. Um, became an ambassador, and, especially in the U.S. market. Exactly. Became an international ambassador. And when I was a child, no one really knew about Italian wine was like flask wine with a straw basket. And even Italian cuisine, when I was a kid, I really remember like the change between the early 80s and the late 1980s and the early 90s when Italian food became way more interesting than French food. I mean, not that French food wasn't, no, but French but it, food yeah. was the top. There was nothing that could even come close. It was the reference with, point. Yeah. It was the reference point. So I guess between seeing this and happening in New York and kind of all this ancient energy in Motelcino, um, I, I, I'm sure that dad was, you know, a positive kind of catalyst in helping Motelcino be known as well. Some, you know, we were small, we're tiny, a winery compared to some of the bigger guys. And at the time, Ezio Rivella, um, Gianfranco Soldera, which is dad planted with help of Gianfranco. So the first vineyards we did are three meter spacing, um, 90 centimeter from one plant to the other. So today, that would be considered very wide spacing, almost too wide. Um, and only Sangiovese available at the time was the classic Big Berry Sangiovese. So now it's kind of taboo to say Sangiovese Grosso. Grosso right? But um, in fact, Sangiovese, the original Sangiovese from Montalcino, tended to have that bigger berry. 
Um, and that's what most of the original plantings dad did there at the Romitorio. There, there weren't much. I mean, it's eight and a half hectares of Brunello at the time. Um, and dad being a painter and living in New York, it was kind of like his more of a hobby than a, than a you know, life dedication. Um, but yet the place had a character. There was for sure a character of Romitorio, high altitude, um, very light wines at the time. But also the climate was completely different. So today we find ourselves a bit in, in, a, in a situation of, um, anyway. Of, but for those, I mean, just to... a, a word on the castle and your property, for those who perhaps haven't seen it, or I would actually urge you to go look it up on the internet. It is probably one of the most fascinating properties and castles in the whole area. Romitorio is almost like a square. So, I mean, you were talking about possible you know, past uses. And it, it is very romantic to think what this castle, who built it and how it became the way it is, because it sits, you know, in a very prominent, um, on a point that you can see the town of Montalcino on, on, you know, to the, slightly to the northern side. And then, of course, you have this big expanse of forest and everything that kind of looks towards the Tyrrhenian Sea. And you are in exactly. one of the kind of cooler areas, higher altitude, but it is a very yes. special place. And, and even the, as I said, the architecture of the, of the castle is just completely, it's just crazy. Well, it's, 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 uh, it was it's probably, unique, completely unique. it's very unique. Um, there isn't one wall which is parallel to the next. So it was probably <laughs> made for deflecting cannonballs or arrows. There's all the feritoie for, you know, protecting the castle. So it was definitely um, a fortified farm at the time. Um, the what you can see, seeing Siena and Montalcino being in the northwest, um, we're right above the Montosoli Hill. So we go from Val de Cava, which is, you know, the valley of the, of, of the quarry, basically, right. which is an old stone quarry, going all the way up. And we have 200 hectares of forest. So it's very, very um, protected. And our only neighbor is the Loacher family, who's a biodynamic um, and we've also been for the past 10 years, today we're getting certified, we'll be certified in two years. But it's kind of like a, a little triangle of forests and rivers and this incredible view. But we're also very protected from the winds of the sea because you have to think that there's basically a Y, a main river coming in from the sea, and then it splits into the Umbrona and the Orcha right uh, where Banffi is. So that's like a, a big like it, it was as if you severed Italy and just the warm winds from Africa just mm. plummet right in. <laughs> and, and at the nighttime, they come down from the Amiata, which is the opposite direction. And that's kind of what's happening in the south of Montalcino. In the north of Montalcino, it's completely different. We have more continental influences. We're more connected to the Val d'Orcia. Um, so really, Romitorio, this, and the structure is incredibly beautiful. Quadriangular. Um, probably had an impluvium in the center of it. There was probably a spring there because it mm. had to be holed up to being under siege. Um, and when we made our cellar, I found an, inc I mean, an incredible, like kind of crystal uh, with all these incredible crystals, like tall three meters cave with all these just oh enormous. And so there was de uh, certainly an underground river happening there at the time. Um, and the soils on one side are deep red soils like burgundy. On the other side, they're gravelly. As you go down, they're shale uh, or whatever, galestro, what they, and the different types of galestro. So there's yellow galestro. So it's, it's in, you can tell that it's a mix of all these different compressions and implosions. And, but it's a magic hill with a magic energy as well. So I liked how you described in, it before, an ancient energy. I think that's fantastic. An it ancient certainly energy. is. It certainly is. And, and architecturally, it's something unique of, in its kind. I think there's nothing else that I've ever seen in my life. It looks more like Tibetan than, than something from... Oh, it's totally crazy. And in fact, I can see, you know, someone with your father's aesthetic, you know, um, you know uh, Falling priorities, you know, uh, and even, you know, in, in, in uh, Filippo's father, Sandro Kia, and his paintings are just huge and colorful and embraceive and warm and I mean there's a there's a you know quality of light and all this great uh, action going on so I could see how a place like that would just be an inspiration well, that's one thing that's really special about Montalcino is the way the light moves and it's never too much because of these hills and these gullies there's just something very magical about any part of Montalcino 
it's it's like an island of magical light because it is an island it's cut off in three on three sides by rivers and each area is quite different t crazy you know uh soil variation and so forth but the thing that ties it all together is the way the light moves and if you see you know if you have the privilege of being there for long periods of time the sun, obviously, you see that move because over the summer it's in one position and the winter's in a completely different position. Um, but in whatever position it is, at whatever time of the year, it has something really like extraordinary. Like it, it's almost like as if a portal into into a certain part of Tuscany. In fact, Montalcino connects Maremma or the south of Tuscany to the north of Tuscany. So if you think po uh, Pogione, Banfi, that's basically the Maremma. Mm, right. Okay, it's paint. It's put. It's right above Monte Cucco. It's a completely, completely different energy than that of the Orcha, which is an ancient sea basin. And basically, from Pisa to Radicofani, which is a small town, that all just dropped under the sea and came back out like twenty or thirty times in the past, I don't know, ten million years. And so there is this aspect of kind of a lunar landscape in that on the northern part of Montalcino, with these Crete Senesi coming down. Um, and and it's and that's the kind of energy that Romy Torrio has, like more of that kind of Valdorcha. Uh, that's it. It's, that's Val Valdorcha vibe, at. right? Yeah, the Valdorcha <laughs> vibe, precisely. Listen, I see um, people have connected from various places. I wanted to say that I saw. I wanted to shout out to Finland. I see Brazil, Colombia, Spain, and Friuli and Trentino. If anybody is watching from any other place, if you'd like to tell us where you're, um, where you are watching from, just send us a little message so we can see what countries are following us. And of course, as always, if anybody has any questions for Filippo, just uh, go ahead and let us know, and we'll try to. There, Canada, hi, Argentina. Argentina, we'll try nice. To answer. Vice is York. That's my friend from York. <laughs> Latvia. Latvia. Hello. <laughs> nice. In Brazil. Belgium. Belgium. No, there it's we go. There's Christian. There's, There's Christian. Grande Christian. Uh, <laughs> I want to shout out Christian Valbruzzoli from, uh, from California. I mean, he's from Florence, but he's our ambassador <laughs> in California. And love he him is, very he's, much. He's your importer here, and he does a great yes. job. He is a man of tremendous energy and passion, and he's like a little whirling dervish. <laughs> he just goes through, you know. With all kinds Amazing. of great energy and a lot of love and passion for Italian wine, he transmits with great, great, you know, success here in California. So we all, we all owe a debt of gratitude. I totally to agree. <laughs> yes, Lyra. Um, so, yeah, I was fortunate to see him in Florence a few weeks ago or about a month and a half ago at this point. Yeah, but, Christian uh, has been good about going. He's been he's been been able to travel a little bit back and forth, which is great. So listen, okay. Yes. So Filippo, so you gave us a really good kind of you know landscape of Montalcino and kind of a you know portrait of your territory. And you mentioned some of the soils. We'll get to the soils just in a little bit. But okay. um, I wanted to ask. All right, so a little bit about your wine program. So Castello Romitorio has really come out. I would say in the last ten years or so. Um, with vintages that are just, I mean, you know, every time I taste them, there's Thank always you. something That's new. They're just, no, they're just really fantastic. And you really get a sense, you know, of your, of your soils, of your place, of the coolness. They're one of the most terroir-driven wines, especially because you are in a very unique area of Montalcino. So give us a little bit of a, you know, um, kind of an overview of your portfolio of wines and kind of the different vineyards that you can play with. And then maybe you can tell us a little bit about the the soil differences and kind of what are the nuances um, in your okay. in your farming? Well, I took let's say I took over Romitorio in two thousand five, I, when I graduated, and Dad had been kind of giving uh, carte blanche to a wonderful fellow from Montalcino who had run the farm before me, um, but at the time, the idea of taking care of the vineyards was very different than it is now. So lots of chemicals happening, lots of uh, no green manure, pruning. It was more about high yields than low yields. Okay, it seems like yesterday, but 20 years ago when Montalcino was very, very different than it is today. And I was a young man, 21 years old, and, uh, and I thought, well, let's build a cellar. We were first making the wines in the castle, in the, in the, in the old stables of the castle. <laughs> 
And I built this kind of state of the art cellar. So at 21 years old, I started a project of building a 3000 square meter cellar underground. Um, and that's, that's when an education I found right there. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. It was insane. Um, so we put together this, this, there was a little warehouse where dad used to paint and basically behind it, I dug out the mountain, um, where I found this crystal vein, um, and put in a kind of prefab structure, which is now my, um, test, my, uh, you know, vats and the, the aging of wood and so forth and my bottle storage which is all temperature controlled, because that also wasn't happening. I mean, you'd bottle right. these wines after five years of work, and it, was, it wasn't in a temperature controlled. So those were the technical kind of structural things that we needed to get going. And the vineyards, there was one vine here and one vine after like 30 meters, you know? I mean, in vineyards and setter, a system, they need a certain regularity. They, they're connected underground by their roots. And the stronger their, their force is, the more they can repel the forces of the forest, of Maldalesca, of all sorts of different illnesses that attack them. So the first thing I wanted to study and to get on top of was to make sure that the old vines were being replanted where there was missing vines and that we were giving the harmony back to the soil. So big work of opening the, the fields, of using these little mini aratrini to help get the, the roots going again. I mean, really like a restoration of the vineyards, um, which, which you, normally doesn't need to be done if you're doing it every year and really on top of things. Right. But in my case, it was, it was mandatory. Um, while doing that, obviously, also vinifying separately and being, trying to be careful with some part, there's lots of soil variation in Motelchino, so some parts will ripen earlier than others or so, so that was a cultural baggage that my cellar master had who had served under my father. But there is something about the character of the producer and the producer need to see, see it and taste it with his own. So let's say the first five years were, were these, kind of, these kinds of tests and getting things back on, on, on the road. Um, and then we decided to, I decided to plant a few hectares of vineyard slightly differently. Um, with much more intense um, spacing. So 270, 70, or 270, 80, compared to three meters, 90. Um, so, so that was kind of a, a Franchetti-style planting um, <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, it's what Andrea had always been doing. And I thought, well... The higher we density, able, Higher density, we might be able to get a little more power out of that, and so on and so forth. It was a great idea. Because my first planting was in 2006, um, again in 2008. Today, those vines are like 15 years old. Or no, 2008, they're 14 years old. So right. whatever, we're into. So, so they're just giving that kind of uh, very, 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 very interesting um, fruit that, that probably is necessary for moving forward and has been a revolutionary because a uh, revolution for all of us. Like Francesco from Canalicchio started planting in the same way in his zone. And all the young guys that are my young, I mean, we're all like almost 40 now, but when we started, we were 20 and we were young, kind of had inherited this stuff from our fathers who had done a great job all in very varying ways. But um, that's the, and there we also planted some new clones. Um, and those were the clones more based from Chianti. So smaller berry clones, they didn't tend to swell with rain um, and, and, you know, had slightly thicker skins, more seed. So that was one of the things that I also, I also started implementing. And so the old vineyards with this big spacing, with the big berry, zoning those and planting some of these kind of newer clones. Um, and basically just trying to understand what could be done with those grapes and how they reacted in the cellar. So we, we, we moved to open a tank conical uh, conical stainless steel tanks, which then I integrated also with cement eggs. And it's all um, mechanical push down, so we do very few pump overs. It's, we don't um, use any pumps in the, in the winery before um, the, like the grapes get dumped into the tanks rather than pumped right. into the tanks. And uh, whatever, hand selection, we don't have any optical, uh, optical bank, so it's all done by hand, which I think is really important as well. But we do de-stem. We have like a really good 
probably we have the same destemmer that Gianfranco had, which is like comes from France, top secret, whatever, <laughs> this special machine you got to wait years to have and so forth. But so I have certain things that were, were tools that helped to really make sure that what came into the vineyard, came in from the vineyard, was handled the best way and preserved in the best way. And the fruit was just, you know, never, also the choice of yeast took years to figure out exactly because we inoculate um, to make sure that we had just something that never overpowered our Sangiovese. And it's different than maybe what someone else, whatever, in Cherbaya or in Castelnuovo de Labate will be using. So we have very thick skins. We're one of the last to pick in Motocino. We go from 500 meters to basically 200 meters because we own the whole mountain and all our vineyards are in these little enclaves in the forest. And so there um, I had, let's say, to find a general formula that really kept the character, which is also my character. I started when I was young, so I wanted to make wines that weren't sleepy and mushroomy and like barky. Uh, I wanted to make wines that had, you know, really preserved the terroir, but had a nice fruit and a nice kind of uh, sprightly right. kind of good, bright acidity and energy. And so, um, it, you know, it took time, but we've, I've, like 15 and 16 for me are probably the vintages where we best express that. And they're totally different vintages, but, um, but they, they're kind of like the pinnacle of that work. And I think moving forward, it can only get better. Um, and also with the climate change, maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, Romitorio may have been a little cool um, compared to other areas. So there wasn't that kind of power that you'd get out of other parts of Montalcino. But now with these you know, temperatures changing, um, especially daytime temperatures, it's, it's, you know, grapes are ripening much faster. So to de delay that is one of the keys. I mean, great Sangiovese comes from all of Tuscany, also from Corsica. I went to Corsica last year. Mialuccio in Corsica is amazing, you know, and it was brought by the Pisani in the 1500s. So it's, the, you know, the Sangiovese is very versatile. It can, it can thrive with, uh, it, it, the only thing it doesn't want is too much canopy. So it needs mm -hmm. to come into harmony in terms of right. its vegetative state. So the poorer the soils, the better it is. It can also survive without any canopy. I mean, in the south of Montalcino, if you were to drive around this summer, there was three leaves on the vine right. and the grapes were ripening. So it's very hardy. It's very special. But what's happening in, in Montalcino is that because of the rivers, because of the continental climate meeting with the Mediterranean climate, it just excels. And basically any producer, and we're a group of fantastic, crazy, eclectic people, everyone different from the other. There's farmers, there's intruders like me, there's billionaires, there's pharmaceutical companies, there's all sorts of people that have been attracted to this energy. Um, and, and there is really a light motif that connects us all, which I think is very unique and is recognizable, you know, out of the glass. Um, in most cases. So I'm very just honored to be part of this orchestra. And my duty is to make sure that I represent the Northwest, the Bosco, these kind of more ferros terrains. We have, um, I don't know if it's time to talk about soils, but yeah, we go have ahead. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the top of the hill of Romitorio is very similar to Burgundy, has these red earths, which is called. Um, in slang, we call it the Maronetto earth, which is because it's colored like a, a, a chestnut. So it's a reddish chestnut color. It's very different than the uh, Galestro earths that you find lower in the hills. So basically, beneath the town of Motolcino, all around that crest and around Romitorio, which are two an analogous hills, um, you get this red earth. As you go down further, uh, and those were beaches, so all those parts around like 50 meters below the church of, Romito of, uh, of Montalcino, going down like 300 meters and all around Romitorio in those hills, you, you'll find fossils, spirals this big or enormous blocks of oysters being attached to an old pebble. Um, and, and it's just very common to, to see this. And for sure, there's three distinguishable, be distinguishable beaches of which two are in our, um, are in our property. But if you think, even if you go to uh, beneath uh, Sant'Angelo in Cole, 
down in that valley, that was another beach. So there must have been like seven or eight or hundreds of times that this came in and out. And I think that this has created great subsoil, great drainage, because we have all these little rocks and all these little things. So you see rich earth, organic earth at the top of the hills, but, um, but the subsoil is well draining, and there we do relatively high yields. So it's, it's, you have to do it to keep that elegance and to keep the power, right. and, and, and they ripen well there. As you go down further down towards Montosoli or Valdecava, you see much more shale, um, all that splintery, always well draining, um, but their yields necessarily need to be a little lower because the canopy will never hold up that amount of fruit. So we're actually, as you go further down, you're finding yourself with much poorer earths in a way, slightly hotter daytime, uh, nighttime temperatures because at Romitorio, even in August, you need a sweater. I mean, right, right. You're not going to go out and it's because it's really at the peak of the hill, open all around with the forest behind you. Um, and basically these, these different plots, all these little micro plots just have come together. They come together as an orchestra. We start basically end of September and finish the end of October and it's just 15 hectares. So sometimes we harvest the same vineyard, you know, divide it into three plots, but harvest it more than once. And often I leave a little, you know, the smaller berries, the more spargolo berries, I'll leave them like a week longer. So we harvest, we don't harvest with teams, we harvest all with our own personnel since we're so small. Um, and I have another winery in Scansano which harvests basically a month earlier. So I move them all to Montalcino and we unite and work, um, and work together. And it's very much a visual kind of analysis. The smaller the grape, the, you know, the smaller the cluster, smaller the grapes, the healthier the vine, we choose usually to leave that on the vine, um, and that once in a while becomes a reserva. If not, it gets integrated into our Brunello. So basically our normal Brunello, which is this bottle here, that has yeah, a centaur. Can... Um, this With is your our... dad's, all your bottles have your dad's artwork. Yes, um, and this is basically our, our, what you know some people call their classic Brunello or just Brunello. And this is basically seven vineyards, these seven, three of which are very old. Um, the fourth was planted in the early 90s, and the other three are new plantings done by me um, mo quite recently, I mean, in the past 15, 16 years. But, you know, at 15, 16, the vines in Motolcino are already expressive. They're already showing. So it's, they're already showing, and they're already ready for Brunello. So, Philippe, especially you, you if painted. they're cared for in a certain way. You paint such an accurate um, kind of portrait of the tweaks that not only you personally have undergone, you know, in, in the pursuit of making better wine each year, but you've also just created an incredibly detailed map of Montalcino and the various, you know, subregions within the Appalachian, um, you know, the different character characteristics and soil and, ex you know, exposure and temperatures. So, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's, you know, it obviously inspires the thought of how much complexity we still can draw from this appellation and how much more there is to learn and how much, there, how much more there is to express, especially as we begin oh, to absolutely. identify single vineyards that react in, in certain ways. And I know that there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, trying to create a, a map of Montalcino that might show subzones and whatnot but obviously you know from from all the information you've just given us it's so compelling to be able to see montalcino not as a monolithic wine region but as many little parts that work together in this harmony in fact and just like you it, are, like it you is it's totally that way um if you taste a wine from sesta or from the abbey depending where in the abbey, if it's where the Maja is or where it's Poggio di Sotto is or if where Mastroianni is or down by Pietranera or if you go further up towards Biondi Santi and you come down towards Cerbaia to Cerbaiona or Salvioni, each person has a very... And if you walk in those areas at dusk or in the morning, each one has its own plants, its own perfumes, its own soil types. Sangiovese reacts in... And, and the complexity of the entire system is what makes Montalcino very, very unique. And it's just filled, filled with fantastic people. And even the big companies that, you know, have to trust into the, in their workers, 
to make their wines because, you know, I make my own wines with my small team and I'm there 360 days a year. But there's some fantastic wineries where the owner is absentee, I would say, right. except for sending cash. And still the wines are incredible because the people are so connected to their vineyards, the actual teams there, and, and because the results are fantastic and unique. And it's, I must say that, you know, the bar has been set pretty high for us as, in terms of being a collectible, very sought after wine, especially in the past few years, it's become a real global, um, really a global market. Um, we sell in all parts of the globe. I mean, I have an agent in India, an agent in Vietnam, an agent in, in China, Brian, one of the greatest dealers in China, a, a Patesco agent in Hong Kong, my man in Japan. So it's really, and they're all great ambassadors of Motolcino and, and there's many of us. So, so it's, it's, it's been quite a beautiful revolution. And I think it's, we're still in a total experimental phase. I mean, what's happening in Motolcino? Yes, comes from tradition, from these, from basically these first men who went to go unite Italy under Garibaldi. That's who the Biondi Santi, I mean, they had gone out. They saw that Italy was never a country until quite, quite recently. So with the idea of a united Italy, I think there was also an idea of making a wine. Yes, the, the area was special for making wine, but it was also a conceptual idea. And the way that they built it and the way that they, they hit the nail right on the head. And I think that we're... There's, there's great traditional ways of approaching Brunello, you know, big barrels, so no to no and this and that. But each one, whoever is making in their way their expression is, is in my opinion, um, is adding to the cultural baggage of the territory. And so I, I don't have any preclusions against French wood, big barrel, tradition, non-tradition. I think everyone doing the work there, putting their attention there, is actually a sacred process and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to become every year better. Obviously, if hopefully the, also the nature follows us because it's, um, it's been quite a, quite a whirlwind set of years. 14 was very, very cold. 15 yeah. was quite, quite balanced, but with some peaks of heat. 16, great vintage. 17, very, very hot again. 18, hot, but rainy. You know, we've, it's not been, so, so consistent. Even last night, we had a, a very, 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 very cold April um, frost where temperatures went down. In fact, I think Bonfi lost all their prune trees down there by the really? river. I think so. You were so, saying, so it was just a huge, it was just, but it has a, it's, it's, it's the last night it was, it, the temperatures got so It was low. just last night. Yeah. For, uh, but and it was what stage for five the hours. We already show... We already have here growth about we are, yeah. yeah yeah well let's say it depends where you are that's depends another where you are, yeah. depends where you are so probably looking below Sesta from Sesta downwards towards the river you're seeing something about like this big mm. at Romitorio it's like this if not just a closed bud right so we were so. very we were very fortunate not to have very limited damage um, but for instance here in Scansano where they're like this. I lost 10 hectares of vineyard last night. So no Moralino, but, uh, or maybe, you know, very limited Moralino because I have more up in the hills here at 250 above sea level. And it's not said because 1997 had an analogous frost and that was one of the greatest vintages of Motalcino. So sometimes rather than green harvest, which is right, always too frost. late. Right. It's it's better to just start off. I mean, not better. I, literally I nip it in the bud, right? In, <laughs> but literally nip it in the bud. Exactly. That's yeah, that's exactly tragic. It. I mean, you know, we've been watching on Instagram and all the you know the candles in Burgundy being lit because obviously they had uh, devastating uh, frost as well and and very cold temperatures. So this cold front is moving across Europe. And, you know, obviously for people who have vines out there in such a delicate phase of their growth, it's just heart wrenching and very difficult to watch you know, it is. when you think of the damage. You know, I wanted to, um, we, we touched on climate change and it's always a question that comes up and you're, you're in such a unique position as well, because as you said, um, you know, t 20 or 30 years ago, Romitorio was considered very cool and, and maybe even too cool. Um, and now you're kind of sitting in a very good uh, 
position on a as, gold mine no, in a gold joking. mine yeah because everybody's looking for higher altitude vineyards and not only yes. in Montalcino but this is a trend we're seeing across Italy I know that recent acquisitions even from bigger groups have always tried to go you know closer to the Passo de Lume Spento which is the highest point in, in Montalcino and to higher elevations well so, I mean in, yeah in fact if you think Pogione this year ripped out deforested you can you can't do it on an oak forest but you can do it on these pine forests that were planted in the 60s and they ripped out at least 15 or 20 hectares and already started planting two or three there's a run towards the hills because if you're down there in the open field with the hair dryer winds coming from africa i mean it can happen that you make a good wine but it's very hard for the seed to polymerize you know the tannin the color to polymerize so you're seeing like really hot, transparent wines, which are great, you know, for some people, but it's not really like what, you know, the world is looking for, for a right. Brunello. You, Brunellos when I was a kid were like 12.5, 13% alcohol and may have been colored or less colored, but the alcohol levels were way lower. And that also has to do with agricultural practices. Um, so, but it also has to do with the temperatures. So the hills for sure, less light, um, cooler and also with the frost the, f the cold goes to the bottom of the field right, goes to the bottom, and, yeah. and and wherever there is a little bit of humidity stagnando you know stagnating um it just it's like you put a uh a, 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 you know it's it's like fire it's worse than fire because the cold so the hills not only help protect from from the you know the warm weather but they also help protect from the cold weather so strangely enough with these late frosts I think the hills are, are important areas to have, to differentiate in. I'm fortunate enough to only have that. But on the downside is a vintage like 14 where it was very rainy. Temperatures never went above 30 Celsius. I had to skip the vintage. I mean, what's another great thing about Montalcino is you can make a great wine and you find how to sell it wholesale to anyone in a flash, you know, because okay. there's the big boys that help and whatever, Piccini and Banfi and this and that. Right, so right. that's another thing. The whole that market get, there that, you know, yeah, that needs to be so fed. You don't yeah. Like, yeah, you don't just like, you know, ruin, ruin your winery and not have any or have to go to market with something that's not up to par. But, um, but that said, we chose to skip it. So there's, there's, there's pros and cons of being in the hills. Right. But more pros than cons, I think, today. Well, speaking of pros... <laughs> Tell us a little bit about, so the two vintages that we are, um, you know, that, that are on the market now are the 15 Reservas and the 16s, uh, the Classico or the Anatha Brunello, mm -hmm. the, you know, the straight release of Brunello. Um, I had the great fortune of reviewing uh, many of these wines a couple of months ago, and they really are spectacular. I mean, it's, it's such an incredible thing to watch the growth of, the quality growth of uh, of uh, Brunello and Montalcino and, and the, you know, the, the unity of the producers, the way that the Appalachian is beginning to work in harmony and a lot of, a lot of good, uh, good, you know, good ancient energy coming it's in true. from. <laughs> no, there is. No, there is. And I think, I mean, I made a uh, single vineyard in 2010, the Filo di Seta. And at the time there weren't many, I tell you, there was just a few, a handful of single vineyards. Mm -hmm. Ten, five years later, we see, like a hundred new labels. Oh, that's been incredible. There's... Yes, you, so your Filo di Seta is your single vineyard expression. And it's true yes. that that, so the, the, they're, I guess they're called Selezioni wines or, you know. Yeah, they're single Selezioni. Vineyard, right, exactly. in, in Montalcino. So... And, and I also, I'm just noticing the, the number of samples that are now Selezioni, which is, makes me so happy because that means that the vintner is interpreting their wine, you know, according to, to yeah. site. And to honing in place. on one site and just then exactly. really see, because, because the old Biondi Santi style was always to blend two or three zones of Montalcino. Mm -hmm. So he'd have La Chiuse, he'd have Biondi Santi, where he's at there, he'd have another one in Cherbaya, and it was always the balance of these moving into, you know, a, more of a single plot mentality. You start right. seeing these, you know, filo conduttori, so the, you know, these light motifs that connect the wine not so much on balance, but really on site-specific zoning. So that, I think, is very interesting. That's one of the good things that's happened. Um, and 15, honestly, was, was a warm vintage. 
I think of vintage that um, in the Reserva qualities and the single vineyard qualities are probably very collectible. But the straight 15s are wines that, you know, you want to drink. And you, you, you're are probably much more approachable for drinking today and yeah. for the next two to three years. While 16s are, have, in my opinion, um, wines that will last like 30 years and need much, much more time or need to be opened and decanted at least 24 hours ahead of time, if not more. So 15, the way I see it, at least my result was, you know, these beautiful, very approachable in a way wines, that, not that they don't have a long life ahead of them, slightly more alcohol in 15 compared to 16, slightly less color in 15 than 16. Um, but both fantastic vintages and two that should really be compared and will be compared for a long time. And I don't think there's anywhere in history where you have like 97 and 98. No. Right. Uh, 98, 99, no. To 99, maybe 99 in 2001 type thing. Those two, but you skip a vintage. So I don't know. They're, they're, they're particular because of this whole also knowledge coming in it and awareness around Sangiovese of your harvest time. Before the clones, as you mentioned. To, the clones, yeah. but clones, also before yeah. people used to pick the grape and say, oh, it's time to harvest. Now right. we go to the lab and we look at 100 different numbers before harvesting. And to really understand when you're peaking with your tannins and this and that, there's this real much more science I have behind it now. Back in the day, it was like, so, Franco, what do you think? Like, is it time right, right. to harvest? What are you picking? <laughs> right. What are you harvesting? <laughs> exactly. So now we're you, uh, you might have, my dog, Tapo, is just barking. I know that Tapo's oh, come to I visit. Love Tapo. <laughs> He's out here I barking. I don't know if you could hear him. He was kind of I, I can. at the window. <laughs> Well, if you want to let him in, I'm, I'm happy no, to No, no, it's okay. No, he's... <laughs> I usually, when I do these, I try to keep him in the garage or something because he does that. He stands at the window and starts barking. Oh, yeah. He <laughs> wants attention. I have a... He wants attention, exactly. Yeah. He wants attention. I just bought a little farm here next to, to my farm here in Scansano, down by the river, of like a Maremma Bonifica house from the 50s that, you know, was bonafide by... Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers after the right. war, by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Maremma. Maremma wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the U.S. Army. So they gave us DDT and all these chemicals that, right. to get rid of malaria. Um, it was a anyway, marshland, this, yeah. Maremma was, was a, a marshland. Was a, a marshland and, 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 and not, it couldn't, you know, agriculture it couldn't exist there. It was a real mess, and it's true that it was no, modified after the war. You couldn't, you couldn't, uh, you could, there was a risk of malaria. Right. And that was like the Pontina area south of Rome as well had a similar yeah. identical, identical, identical. And they're basically like kind of like Everglade type lands where the rivers coming from Montagnata, from inland Italy were coming and, and being fan kind out of filtered. There. Yeah, they fan out and filtered. It's like a big pampas um, or it was. And then they made the canals and they drained it. And now it looks it's like where, where's they made most of the spaghetti westerns, some of these uh, areas. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I bought this little house there and the guy who sold me the house, there was a little puppet. And so I have a new dog now. His name is Schizo. And when Schizo. Tapo comes, yeah, <laughs> I didn't name him <laughs> Schizo. The, the old owner gave him this name. But I'm very <laughs> proud of this little pupster. So, <laughs> well, Tapo was actually born, born in Montalcino. So there are a lot of little you know, I remember wine, that. wine dogs. Uh, Listen, so, so tell us a little bit. Okay, so you have this great fortune, not only of knowing the territory of Montalcino so intimately um, and at your estate at Castello Romitorio, but you also have a parallel wine activity in the Maremma. So we're talking about a yes. whole different part of Tuscany, different climate, Completely different temperatures. Different. Um, Sancho yes. is basically at the base uh, well, many many things too, but you also have more freedom there, so you have you can introduce other varietals. So tell us a little bit about your project there, and also so, there's such a, we talk about ancient energy. Here you are, right on Etruscan, you know, um, yes. foundation. Basically, I live on a hill where there is a <coughs> ghiaccio forte, fort as in a fort, a fort where the soldiers hide or protect themselves. Ghiaccio comes from agiaccio, which is means out in the open. Or where, where, you know, where lambs are a la mm -hmm. Um And from here, I can see Corsica. So all the hills, the Corsica has 2,000 meter hills with snow. And yeah. on the other side, I see the Montemiata with snow. 
So I'm basically in this incredible kind of circular energy with Giglio right here in front. And it's one of the last areas of Tuscany where you still have Pliocene, Miocene, all the soils from the ancient dinosaur days. Um, as soon as you cross the border with Lazio, which is about 20 kilometers from here, you get all the young volcanoes coming down from Vico, it's Tufo, it's very much younger earth. Here we have soils that are very, very ancient. They're not as deep as Motolcino. Daytime temperatures are much higher than Motolcino, but they're mitigated by this river that, or various rivers, the Umbrone to the north of Scansano and the Albania in the south. Um, and basically, uh, San Giovese fares actually very well here because at night, it never re there's great uh, bagnatura foliare, like humidity that comes down from the sea and from the sea breeze and so forth. Brings so basically down. breeze moisture that allows for the vines never to go into stress. And that was great for the Sangiovese. And we planted here most clones from Moltalcino, so Big Berry, Sangiovese. Then I planted um, M1, all these Chianti, Flacionello clones here. I have like every clone of Sangiovese here in Scansano. So this is where I do my testing and I see how things react with the, uh, you know, um, and, and I, there's some amazing potential here, incredible. Um, just before we used to make, uh, of all the straws, one fascio and make one wine and said, now here I really want to start separating each vineyard and trying to get really into in terms of the Sangiovese. So before the Morellino had Syrah and Petit Verdot being put into it as a what they call corrective wines. Um, and at a certain point, around 2007, eight, I said, you know what, this is neither this nor that. Let's really try to make a Morellino that has at least just one corrective grape and we just settled on Syrah until two years ago when I decided to take all the international grapes out of our Morellino. So it's going to be 100% um, Sangiovese. Kind of taking inspiration from Poggio Valente of Le Pupile, from Rocca Pesta, my friend Alberto Tanzini. There's a few illuminated people making some top quality wines here, but the market just doesn't know how to absorb it. So you have to make the everyday Morellino, especially because it's wines that mostly stay in Italy, these wines. Mm -hmm. um, they're drank by locals. And a lot in Rome, Rome, yeah, it's a huge, mar yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, 30% of my production goes to Rocky, my distributor in Rome, which is <laughs> like containers go to Rome, you know? So that said, I, I also wanted to make an export kind of quality Morellino, and at first I had separated them into two, and now I just make one 100% Sangiovese, which is a Ghiaccio Forte. But to make, to make something that made sense with the Syrah and the, and the Petit Verdot, which were exceptional, great acidity, um, great pH, wines that are built for long-term aging, um, actually sometimes need, need a great deal of time. Some vintages can be approachable. Ease. I came up with the Romi Toro, because that was, which was first called Il Toro, then, right. as you can imagine, you know, some people from Spain and this and that said, hey, what's going on? This it's is totally like exact, this name yeah, so right. much. So, the bull, so the bull, right. And, and the label making, shows a kind of a bull. A bull. Yeah, bull. I don't have it here, unfortunately. But um, The big, but, bold, modern label, really cool. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to tap into that, you know, to a bold pop energy with uh, super... I don't know, white label, right. red clean capsule, graphics and, yeah. clean graphics. And it was, it's a hit. It's my, it's one of our best sellers globally. I sell it all over the world. And if you compare that to Bulgari, you know, the big kind of Il Bruciato or Le Volte, or this, it's like, it, mine is harvested by hand. It's just made with love from those vineyards. I'm just saying that it's a, it's a category that's very sought after international blends from the coast. And I thought, well, let's make one that's unique and, and that sums kind of up two uh, river climates. And both, let's say, Petit Verdot and Syrah thrive along the Gironde River, one along the Mediterranean. So that would be, you know, Cote du Rhone and so forth with the Syrah. And it's rocky soils we have here. So I thought, that makes sense. And how about the Petit Verdot up in, you know, in Bordeaux, in more Medoc? The, it was brought by the Romans to Medoc. Petit Verdot. So it's a very ancient grape, Petit Verdot, much more ancient than Merlot and, and other stuff. 
and it's very hardy and it's very heat resistant, incredibly heat resistant. So basically, like just now, I just planted four more hectares of Petit Verdot and two more of Syrah and just working with different clones, different rootstocks, different soils. But that's also a future. And there's an incredible demand. I never have enough of this, you know, vino for anyone. And people get oh, let great. down often. Uh, yeah. So oh, I love that wine. I mean, it's like, it really hits that, you know, it, exactly as you, as you said, it hits that sweet spot for, you know, a big trattoria dinner and, you know. Exactly. And, uh, it's, and I sell it's, it. It's accessible. It's rich. Yeah. It's, it has a great lot of character and, you know. And, exactly. And, uh, has a, and also, fruit. in fact, the, lots of fruit. And, you know, the Toro, the bull has since Roman times been a sign of fertility, of abundance, of generosity, of sacrifice in a way because right. they were doing the sacrifice of the bull. <laughs> and uh, so I just thought, well, what better image to, to pre and it's, you know, it's like 24, whatever, $25 wine and or 20 euro here in Italy. And it just, I can't make enough of it. So now I'm planting more, moving towards that. And it's, it's just a fun parallel. I love making wine. I love what I do. And the longer I can protract this, I basically do two harvests. One starts at the very, very beginning of September here in Maremma. I do that for 20 days. And then I move on to Montalcino. And let's say I'm, you know, quite, uh, it's kind of like practice for Montalcino in a way. And a warm up. Right. Right, warm up, um, warm up, and have, uh, yeah, we have sellers then, in both. Then... Exactly, literally warm up. Because <laughs> sometimes here it's always you're working with a really bright sun and a totally different vibe of harvest compared to Montalcino, which, as I said, you have your sweater. It gets cool in the afternoon. It's you're harvesting under really full, full sun energy. While in Montalcino, it's very rare that it's more of almost a fall energy. So. It's true. Yeah, it's true. It's the, even the light, you know, and the, and, yeah, the light is totally different. And, uh, and, and I think the longevity of the wine somehow are affected by that. I think that Sangiovese, one of my deductions is that Sangiovese, if you can protract its ripening the later, latest possible, that's where it really gets really elegant and really starts to sing. And Sangiovese is a grape that has so much to do with chiaroscuro, the way that a lot of it is about the vintage, about the temperature, but it can, the same grape can be dark, uh, very, always brick colored. I mean, always tending towards warm colors, never violet, very rarely. Only one clone of Sangiovese is violet. Um, usually they're brownish colors, but anywhere you get it, even within the city of Montalcino or within here in Maremma, they, you can leave them on the skins, macerate for, you know, 12 hours cold maceration or do 24 hour or 48 hour cold maceration, then leave it on the, you know, depends very much on how, on how you work it, both in the cellars as in the vineyard. And it can express a big, powerful dark wine, as well as a really elegant, you know, kind of ballet dancing, bright cherry. And I don't think that one is better than the other. I just think that there's so much versatility there that, um, that is interesting. It's just such a funky grape. The most important thing is to always keep it, you know, fresh and, and good acidity, natural acidity. And, but if you, we see so much variation, even within Montalcino, if you think, uh, stylistically, it, it really, it really, it, it really loves to be, I don't know, accompanied by man and reacts to how you, you work it. Well, I, 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 I like what you said about the chiaroscuro influences on Sangiovese. I think that's very true. You, you, you taste it in the wines. And, and as, you, get, as you, you, know, you really get to know Brunello, it's a theme that definitely comes up. I see more people. Well, I, hello to, there was Patagonia in Argentina and Colombia. Nice. We had a question. Yeah. Uh, there was a I Cornage see. question. What, um, somebody asked, and then we'll, we'll close, Filippo, but... There was a question about your Reserva and mm -hmm. Brunello Reserva, and what do you look for uh, when, you, when you create your Reserva? Okay, that's very interesting. My normal Brunello, you know, I extract a little more, um, and I also use the Torchiati, so the pressings of the grapes, um, and I try to make a Brunello that has great fruit that's approachable but tends to be towards more of the scuro energy of Sangiovese. With the Reserva, I look only for the lightness, for transparency. I only use the Fiore 
I macerate in a very particular way, only in cement. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how I do it because I wouldn't want some of my competitors to, but there's a very particular thing that I do to keep just the lightest and just the most dancey. It doesn't mean it won't have the same dry extract as a normal, you know, as a dark Brunello. It has actually a 30, my 33 dry extract. Incredible. But it's nice. very light and transparent, almost like drinking. It has to dance on the palate. Right, it's and it lifted to, and ethereal. It's lifted yeah. and ethereal. The more, <laughs> there it is. The more ethereal the Sangiovese, the higher the quality. So that's the way I and think of it. I, I, you know, some try to make their reservas like, like a rum almost, like over oaked and very mm -hmm. heavy and put all the power. I think it's the opposite. Power is about ethereal, 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 it's ethereal nature. Um, and so that's the way I think of the Reserva. And the way I make it is in a cement tank, open tank, um, does malolactic in cement. It gets put into a smallish um, uh, Slavonian oak barrel, Boti, which is like 33 hectolitres. So imagine... The big traditional ones are like 7,000 hectolitres, so it's half the size of that. Um, it's about 10 years old, and then I do second, the other half of it goes into second and third passage tonos, but very, very fine grain, very, 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 very fine tonos um, of French oak, um, 500 liter, um, and it's monitored over time, and then usually it goes back into the entry level Brunello, into the normal Brunello. So I do all this work, and then only once, we've only decided to make nine reservas in 30 years. Mm -hmm. So it's very rare that I usually do it. all this work and then just reintegrate it into. But in 15, I made a reserva, and in 16, I made a reserva. Um, and and I did the same thing. There was a question about where the, where the fruit for the reserva. It's a blend of, a very, obviously, it's, a, it's a blend of the three vineyards that my dad planted with Gianfranco Soldera, so wider spacing. None of the new clones go into that, okay? Because the new clones, you know, have a gritty thing to them, and they're also younger vines. So basically, on my oldest vines, the weakest plants, the ones that are with the least canopy, with the smallest berries, get left for three days extra. And sometimes they actually get picked three days earlier, depending if it's like okay. a rainy vintage or something. I say, listen, mm -hmm. let's take, pull this in. You got to always have that. And then it's it's it's... It's your choice after three years, more or less, when you start taste, you taste every day, not every day, but every, every month or so, or every two months, you want to check in on your wines. Um, but when you decide to put together your Reserva and your Normale Brunello and so forth, you, you, do, you kind of decide what's going to become your Reserva and if there's going to become a Reserva. And, and basically, um, in 15 and 16, we did it, and it comes from our oldest vines. So the 30-year-old vines... Uh, BS clone, so Biondi Santi clone, and all the variations on that, which is the Pogione clone, the Soldera clone, but all big berry Sangioveses, which over time, as the vineyard gets old, those big berries actually turn into small berries. They're, but they weren't born as small berries. So that's really the magic there, and that's right, something that age. you can only get over time. And sometimes some of those vines have actually been, because they're all cordon, to, to kind of reignite their energy, we do a shock, a pruning, and we move them to Guyot to give them like more energy, while others don't have that. And for instance, um, the three vineyards, our highest altitude vineyards are all cordon, while in Filo di Seta, I've decided to, to jumpstart a third of it with Guyot. And this is happening a lot in Motocino, the moving to Guyot mm -hmm. to try to give more uh, energy back to the vine. But right. really, the, the weaker the Sangiovese, the better it is, as long as it's not hot heat shock making it weak, you know? All right, Filippo. Well, I have to thank you. Uh, the last comment says, this is very informative, and you have been a wealth of information. I especially well, appreciated you, your overview of, the, of, of all the different sides of Montalcino to give everybody an idea of how complex this region is. So when yeah. you drink Brunello, there is a big story over where that Brunello I know. came from. It's amazing. It's and amazing. that's really though, very important to keep in mind that incredibly varied earths, incredibly eclectic folks making the wine. And, um, and we're, you know, in a phase, there, there's, 
there's also a lot of variation. So I, I, I'm, I get worried when people think they expect just one type of Brunello or just another. So it's about keeping an open mind when you taste these wines, our wines, and, um, and always try to look where the winery is on the map, you know, of Moltolcino. And, um, and when you come, drive around and just see how the soils change, how the perfumes in the, in the hills change. I mean, Monica's done it for years. I've done it for years, but it's a real privilege. And when the world gets back into, into action, I suggest that everyone take a trip to Motolcino who can. We should all get those dirt bikes out. Those yep, in <laughs> fact. Get our old dirt bikes out. In fact. <laughs> I have to dust off the old dirt bike. <laughs> dirt dice off your bike. Listen, Philippe, it's been a great Monica. pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope to see you soon in, in person. Yes, um, me too. Yeah. Hopefully and, uh, and I this hope side of... goes well with all the frost and the, the, warm, the weather, the nighttime temperatures warm up a little we'll bit. We'll see. So. There will be no green harvest. That's for sure this year. Exactly. So at, least, <laughs> at least we'll we'll have a little less work on our hands. But I'm all sure right. it's going to be a great vintage. I hope. I hope Fingers so. Cross. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Ciao, Monica. Filippo. Um, and I say hello to everybody in Multacino for me. I will. Absolutely. And hopefully we'll see, see you soon. Yes. Ciao, Monica. Okay. Ciao. Ciao. A presto.